Hello, I'm Larry Burns, and welcome to another episode of Discovering the Power of You. Today, we have a great guest, uh, a man that I met when I was at the Children's Foundation uh, in Detroit, and we were funding some great organizations helping people, in this case, helping people recover uh, from substance use disorder, uh, and that's when I met Matt Bell. Even though Matt is in Sylvania, Ohio, and I lived in Toledo for 26 years, we did not know each other then, but we got to know each other and became um, partners and good friends. And Matt is willing to uh, tell his story and most importantly now what he is doing to help others uh, each and every day. So uh, I'd like to welcome Matt Bell to Discovering the Power of You. Matt? How are you, Larry? Thank you so much for having me. It's truly an oh, honor. It's great and, I, and I have to say, it's it's great to be in the same space as you. This is, this well, is great, thank you. I miss being in physical rooms with you. I haven't seen you in a yeah, while. Yeah, well, I, exactly. I think the last time we were together was at the DAC and That's right. had a great lunch. And you were telling us about some of the new projects that you have that are now well underway, which we'll talk about. So... I mentioned in the intro that you and I met um, when I was at the Children's Foundation, and uh, we had started the Jamie Daniels Foundation, as you know, and really started to get into helping young people in particular uh, who were suffering from addiction, uh, and met you through a mutual acquaintance uh, and started a great partnership and friendship. And so... I'd like our viewers and our listeners to know how your story started, and then we'll get into what you're doing today. But I think it's important that people have a sense of, of the struggles you had and how you overcame them uh, over time. So if you don't mind. I, I don't mind at all. I love doing this, and I think it's important. Um, I, you know, I, I was raised in a great home, Larry, a, you know, wonderful family. Uh, great upbringing. I went to private schools my entire life. I got straight A's. I played three sports. I went to church on Sunday. Um, you know, I, I had a really good life. When you think of, when society thinks of, I should say, you know, what happens to make somebody become an addict? They typically think of all these, you know, significant traumatic life experiences, or maybe somebody that comes from uh, uh, family history of something like that, which certainly can happen. Uh, but I think a lot of times people just say there must have been something really wrong, either in that person's neighborhood, that person's home with that person's family, uh, something along those lines made that person turn out uh, bad. And I I'll tell you, Larry, I didn't have any of those things I had. When I look back at uh, my childhood, I, I really, truly feel as though my parents did as, as good as they possibly uh, could have. And and as a parent now. I strive to be like my parents were. They did the best that they could. They were amazing. And and so, you know, straight A's, I, I didn't hang out with people that um, experienced with uh, or, uh, or experimented, I should say, with drugs and alcohol. I wanted nothing to do with it. I was raised to stay away from that sort of stuff. And um, uh, and I did I, I managed to do a really good job of that. In fact, I broke up with my very first girlfriend in seventh grade. I broke up with her because she smoked a cigarette. I wanted nothing to do with her. And so then, you know, then I go to I go to high school. And when I got to high school, I went to a really large, all boys, very competitive college preparatory school, another private school. And for the first time in my life, I felt uncomfortable the very first time because my whole life I was used to the same really good thing, the same thing every day. And and, and so I was I was feeling these feelings of, of vulnerability and, and inferiority. And and uh, at, at that same time, my my dad who was like literally my superhero the best man that i believe ever walked the earth in my eyes uh got diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer and they found it late and it had already spread to his his uh blood and his bones and his brain and so he passed away about three weeks later mm -hmm. on father's day and so as oh. a fresh in, as a freshman in high school that was like my my world just completely changed i mean i, I it was the perfect storm as somebody that was already not feeling good about the situation that they were in, plus losing the only person I really wanted to, you know, make proud in my life, um, I immediately started seeking 
outside approval. And so, you know, that, that started ironically with cigarettes, uh, even though I just broke up with my girlfriend for a a year and a half prior and, and cigarettes led to, I I tell people this all the time. I speak at a lot of schools. You are who you surround yourself with. And I'm not talking about kids. I'm talking about human beings, regardless of how old you are, you are who you surround yourself with. And if you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. If you hang out in a barbershop long enough, you'll get a haircut. And I, and I, and I, and I hung out with those people that were doing stuff just because I wanted to be accepted. I just wanted, I just wanted to be accepted because I was hurting inside. And then I didn't know that I didn't, I didn't know how to vocalize that. I didn't even know how to recognize it. So, you know, one thing led to another and, and it's the, it's the telltale traditional, whatever typical story of, you know, I started smoking, then I started drinking alcohol, then I started smoking marijuana and I, and I, you know, there was no consequences. It was the, um, I think what people think is just accepted in our society today. You know, I did all those quote unquote, normal things that kids just do just kids being kids. And, and, I, and I hate that so much just because that's, there's, there's so much more, there's so much more there to it. I could talk for hours on that, but, um, you know, ended up, um, going to college, went to UT and full ride, uh, for baseball hurt my shoulder. And, um, when I, when I got, uh, the pills, this was in 2006 when I had my first shoulder surgery at the university of Toledo, that was the first time I was ever given a prescription pain pill. And so that, that really caused uh, something to happen in me, which I believe is 100% because of how I experimented with drugs and alcohol in high school prior to experiencing those um, those pain pills. And it, it, it launched uh, a 10-year bout with uh, prescription opioids. It started with pain pills, and it ended up uh, injecting um, heroin every single day. And that, that decade, in a nutshell, was... 13 arrests in four different states. I'm a felon in three states. Um, I went to 28 rehabs all over the country. I was homeless for multiple years. I overdosed three times. And I, and I, in the end, when I got clean, which was in 2015, I had absolutely nobody that wanted anything to do with me. So, I, you know, I went from a kid that had the world in his hands, truly nothing but opportunity to somebody that, uh, had absolutely nothing and nobody and never thought it would happen to me, but I'm, I'm so grateful that, you know, I found help and I stuck with it. And, and, uh, that was in 2015, October 15th, 2015. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that, Matt. And of course. So, so what, what do you think the biggest step was to, to get well, what the, the over 20 rehabs, the countless years of, of struggling, um, what what was it finally that helped you realize your life could be much better? You know, Larry, I the first twenty seven times uh, somebody else wanted me to get better. You know, and, and a lot of times it was a judge, a probation officer, my mom, a girlfriend, whoever I was dating at the time, family members. You know, I never wanted to get clean, and if and if I did want to get clean. I just wanted to stop using heroin. I never wanted to like fully give up um, alcohol and marijuana and everything else. Because again, we're raised as a society to think that that is how you have fun. And, and, and for somebody like myself, I, I cannot do that stuff to have fun. And so, you know, I can't tell you how many times I went through treatment and just said, you know, I'll stop doing heroin and and stop, stop doing the hard drugs, but I'm still going to, of course, I'm going to have a beer at a barbecue. Of course, I'm going to go to a concert and smoke a joint. Of, of course, I'm going to, you know, cheers a, 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 a champagne at a wedding. What do you mean I can't do that? I'm 27 years old. You're telling me I can't do that? I'm an adult. I'm a grown person, you know? So um, I was I was never willing to fully concede to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic and an addict. That's what didn't work the first 27 times. The other thing that didn't work is I didn't I didn't ask to go. And so when I went on that 28th time, it was I, I need to go. That was the only time I ever said I need to go to treatment. I hate the way that my life is right now. I know for a fact I'm better than this, and I'm ready to completely give up everything. And and ever since then, it's been it's been a beautiful thing. Excellent. And and so what advice do you have um, to people that have a loved one 
uh, a child, a grandson, a granddaughter, um, a spouse themselves that, that is struggling? What, what are some of the advice points can you give to those folks uh, that might help them get on the road to, uh, to recovery? You know, it's, it, it's, it's never too late. I think that's the biggest thing. One of the biggest things is people often feel that they're too far down the hole. And I can relate to that. You know, I can really relate to, um, man, how am I going to, how am I going to get my family back? I, I ripped off every bank in the area. I'll never be able to get a checking account again. My credit's gone. My driver's license is gone. I owe court costs all over the place. You know, like that, that's a thinking about all that is a lot to say, man, can I ever actually take care of all that stuff? And, um, you're still alive, you know, like it, it's going to take time. And my, my message would be that it's going to be hard because it took a long time to, to ruin or make things difficult. It took a long time. We've been doing this stuff for years, sometimes years and years. And so it's not going to change overnight. Like life's not just going to go back to being perfect in a, in a day or in a month or in a 28 day rehab or anything like that. It's going to take a, a long time. What I will say is even though it's not going to be, easy it's going to be worth it absolutely going to be worth it so i i am so glad that you are where you are today and you recently got married you recently had uh, a baby um and i watch your videos and you're making such a difference so we we heard the story of how you became um an addict and the journey that you had and now you're helping others so let's let's talk about what you're doing now in sylvania and beyond uh so that people uh, who need your help may look you up and 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 have a visit so uh so how did you get to where you are now well you know larry i I, I thought about what am I going to, what am I going to do with my life? I remember sitting in detox actually, and I ha I still have the letter. I have it framed in my house and I wrote out all these things that I wanted to do with my life in detox. I probably had 48 hours clean, two days, still going through active withdrawals. And I said, man, I've got felonies. I know that I studied business in school. I know what I'm capable of. I have leadership qualities. I know what I want to do in my life. And maybe all these things just actually happen for a reason, because as I sat there and reflected in detox, I thought about all these people that I was using with for the last 10 years and a, a very large majority of them are no longer with us. And I said, I, I had to have made it through this for a reason. I ha it would be a shame for me to not take this liability and turn it into an asset for myself and for for my community because I do love Toledo. I love my town and I don't ever want to leave here. And so I said, what what does that look like? Where are the gaps? Where are the inconsistencies? And what, you know, what's being offered in Toledo and what's not? And so it originally just started with service work. I just wanted to do service and start a nonprofit that did exactly that. And, you know, no agencies were doing prevention in schools, primary prevention in schools. No agencies were doing family support groups. No agencies were doing a crisis hotline to say, you can call us 24 seven and we'll just listen to you. We'll point you in the right direction. We'll tell you where the next meeting is at or whatever it might be. And so we developed that. We started while, again, while in treatment, started just a, a nonprofit, developed a board of directors. We got some amazing people to donate their time. And we launched this thing in about six months and it was, I mean, by the IRS regulations, an approved 501c3 while we were still living in the recovery house at the largest treatment center here in Toledo. And, and, uh, through that service work, Larry, it just, it just, it morphed, you know, like it, it started and the community loved it because it was needed because it was so philanthropic and just pure. And, um, you know, People said, man, I love that you guys are doing this, but we need more from you. We need you to do treatment because you guys have you guys have a different lens that a lot of these other people aren't looking at it through. And your experience is valuable. So if you guys are going to be able to do treatment with the same doctors, the same you know clinicians and all this stuff, but with an approach of somebody who's been through it before, 
that could be a very, very powerful thing because at the end of the day, we're talking about life or death here and we need something that's going to help people live. So, uh, you know, it was just ideas and, and requests and um, a lot of hard work. And, and that's that's what we did. We, we got licensed uh, nationally with the highest accreditation you can have through CARF. And then we went through the state of Ohio and uh, I would say 98 percent of the calls that we get are Ohio Medicaid calls. So, so that's the funding source that we went after was Ohio Medicaid. We're licensed with all Ohio Medicaid plans. And uh, we, you know, we currently offer, we have 150 something, 154 beds, I believe right now. And every single one of them is full. And wow. when we, when we launched our services uh, 12 and a half months ago, we started with five employees. Today we have 65 employees in just 12 months. In 12 and months in 12 months and uh we're sharing offices in the building that we're in uh we're closing on two more buildings in the next two months um, and our plan is to expand to probably 150 to 200 employees and and add 75 to 100 more beds because it's needed and people really really want to come to us you know people know that we our slogan is we have a new approach to an old problem and yeah. And, and, and the community knows that. And so families are calling us, people that are struggling are calling us. Uh, we have contracts with all the hospitals and work really well with Toledo Fire and EMS. And it doesn't matter who it is, people know, know team recovery and they know it's about Toledo and they know it's like, we're doing this. We're not some you know large company that just came in to capitalize off Toledo, like we're from here. And this is our way to give back. And so, um, that, you know, it's it's just it's such an honor to be able to serve the community, and 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 just try to get one more person to go back to their homes and their families and and be happy and usefully whole again. It's yeah. it's a dream come true. Yeah, well, you can really tell your sincerity that it means so much to you. And and one of the things I've learned knowing you for a while, you know, plus I mentioned I now live in in South Florida, and as I'm sure you know. Jupiter and Palm Beach, West Palm Beach is, uh, has a lot of recovery centers. And the ones that I've met that I feel are really good are people in recovery like yourself, like the lens that you have, that they have, uh, it makes a world of difference. Um, and, and I think people that need help uh, understand that within 10 minutes of talking to somebody like you, Mm -hmm. uh, versus maybe somebody that hasn't experienced many of the things. So um, you're doing uh, God's work in that. And so I mentioned I met you uh, through the Children's Foundation. And one of the things that we were interested in, particularly I was interested in, is how families are impacted. I mean, obviously, they're impacted in a negative way by a loved one being um, sick but how families can impact a person's recovery. Uh, and we funded a project for you, uh, with you, to, to see how that works. So can you give our viewers, our listeners, an idea of how that family-centered care uh, is coming along? 100%, absolutely. So, and, and, and I'm so grateful for the funding that came uh, from the Children's Foundation because it's something that's still happening today. And it wouldn't be happening. I truly don't believe it would have happened if it weren't for you guys. Uh, one of our original ideas, again, was, you know, and I thought about it for my own situation. I wonder if I would have had to go to treatment 28 times if the therapists and nurses and whoever it was in my first 27 treatment centers would have talked to my mom. If they just would have had a conversation with her, if they would have invited her to a meeting, if they would have taught her something, maybe explained what my process looks like when I'm going through detox and how I might call and try to say, Hey, I don't like it here. I want to come home, come pick me up. You know, all these things that, that can be uh, sort of um, coached and say, Hey, when your loved one reaches out and says, I hate the food at this treatment center, I want to come home and have a, a home cooked meal. Can you please come pick me up? You know, there, there are ways to respond to that sort of stuff. And, and we had an idea that was, if we have a licensed social worker, a licensed therapist that is solely dedicated to the families, they, they do not work with the, the clients that are in treatment at all. They only work with the families that 
in the friends and the employers and et cetera that surround that client, if we educate them, counsel them, teach them, will it increase the length of stay in treatment? Will it increase the successful outcomes? Will it decrease people leaving against medical or clinical advice? Um, essentially, will it help people stay clean longer? And, you know, we were very passionate about it and we, we believed that, that the answer would be yes because we've seen it happen in our own lives and we've seen it happen when we developed our own family support group. And we weren't licensed counselors at the time. We were just being there for these families and their loved ones were getting better because we were helping them. And, you know, addiction is a, it's a family disease. One person uses, but the entire family suffers. And, and, it, and it's just not fair because these families get, get, you know, they truly just, it's a, it's a hijack situation because they love this person. They feel like what they're supposed to do is, is be there for them. And it's so difficult because there's such a fine line between supporting and enabling somebody that is in active addiction to any substance. And so understanding that from a say, telling a mom, you, you should not feed your kid because if you give them food that costs $10, that's $10 that they get to use on their drug of choice. So you are not giving them money to get high, but you're essentially saving them money so that they can get high. Explaining that to a family, it doesn't make sense to a mom. It doesn't make sense to a dad who, who looks at their baby. I think about my baby. I'm like, I could never not feed my hungry baby. Uh, but it's a process, just like it is a process for individuals to get clean. It's a process for family members to get to that point where they understand that difference. And we saw incredible. I wish I, I wish I was prepared in, in, in answering this question about that. But, you know, I, I believe that our uh, target metrics on, on successful outcomes was after they were coached for a certain amount of time, if the loved one was still in treatment to see it at 85 percent success rate. And we I mean, we were just so far above that. It was the numbers were like astronomical. We could not believe it. And so we decided to take that from that pilot program of one clinician to now we have three therapists that are solely dedicated to the families. And, and it indirectly helps the loved ones stay in treat the, the, the addict or alcoholic themselves stay in treatment. It was one of the coolest projects I've seen because now you're not just helping the person that's in your treatment center. You're truly helping so many other people out there, the families, and one of the coolest things that we didn't even anticipate, but now, we, now we've now we educated 10 other people that surround that person. So they're getting people from work and they're getting people from out in the community and their neighbors and they're, and, and they're just, they're now linking people to treatment. And so it was, again, one of those things where it was like, we just need to lead with our heart with good intentions and believe that good things are gonna happen. And the ripple effect has been phenomenal. Yeah. So the, the other thing, and I'm so glad that we were able to fund that and um, both personally and, you know, as the president of the foundation, I, I was a tremendous advocate for, for that project because I know firsthand how a family can be impacted. And the other thing that I have to believe you're making progress on with families and just the general is the stigma that, you know, in my youth, the, the idea of a drug addict was a person on John R. in Detroit, um, you know, and, and uh, they sort of chose to be there and, and um, they were begging for food. And so this stigma has taken place for so long that, that I have heard, you know, particularly different um, nationalities. It's so bad that parents lie to their family and their friends about their own issue or their child's issue. And so I guess, are we making progress on breaking down the stigma of addiction? We are, you know, I know that we are, and there's, you know, there's so many amazing, there's been a huge movement of that, you know, because suffering in silence does kill people and, and stigma does lead to wanting to suffer in silence. You know, I think nobody wants to say, Hey, I'm an addict or, Hey, my son's an addict. My wife's an addict. Nobody wants to say that. Like there is a there is a very humbling component to that. However, when you can do that, that is the first step. You know, that is the absolute first step is to recognize what the problem is, because we can't work on a solution unless we can acknowledge the problem. And so, getting people to normalize 
not just addiction or alcoholism or just, just, just being able to normalize, I need help with something, whatever it is. It could be food. It could be gambling. It could be substances. It could be vaping. It could be there. You know, there's a thousand issues that people are having problems with in our world today. And so being able to normalize and get to a point where it, it's okay to not be okay. Uh, it's not okay to stay not okay. Uh, and, and realizing that there is an answer out there and there are so many ways to find help, whether that's inpatient, outpatient, telehealth, support groups, the list goes on and on. And so I'm like very, very proud and happy to see the movement that's taken place in our, in our country to decrease, you know, stigma. And, and some of that is, is harm reduction. Some of that is just, just resources that are out there. Some of that is changing the narrative on the language that we use about individuals. Um, but you know, stigma is changing for sure. It is absolutely yeah. getting better. Well, and you're a big part of that. The fact that you're willing and really good at it about talking about um, your journey and really having nothing you won't talk about, it, it helps break down that stigma because it inspires other people to say, hey, I have a problem, my dad has a problem, um, and so you, you're doing that uh, each and every day as you as you continue to talk about your own journey as well. And, and so I commend you, Thank uh, you wholeheartedly for that. And so where um, team recovery, where do you see team recovery going in the next, uh, let's say, couple of years? So it's funny you say that we were working on our three, five and 10 year plan today. There we go. Yeah. So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're getting two new buildings. Um uh, We've just outgrown this one so so quickly. We need to uh, open up a, a hospitally zoned inpatient uh, facility. Um, so that'll be a twenty thousand square foot, seventy five bed, medically monitored, staffed twenty four seven. You know, doctors and nurses type of situation. It'll be uh, detox and inpatient levels of care. So I'll have that open probably within the next nine to twelve months. Uh, we're opening an OTP, which is essentially a medication assisted treatment clinic. Um, there is data behind that, that they, these, there's really good medications out there. Uh, medicine is advancing significantly and, uh, there are some wonderful medications to help people, you know, get through that initial phase of either detox or, uh, or, you know, for, for perpetuity for the rest of their life. Um, we're, uh, working on an executive headquarters right now, just because our, our, Sea level staff right now is just, I mean, we're taking up so much space in our treatment center to where it's like, if we could get out of this building, we could put more clinical therapists and, and case managers and things like that in the building. So, um, you know, and I have a whole list of, uh, you know, we want to open up primary mental health. We want to get into adolescence uh, by year five. Um, I, I will be a social worker, a master's level social worker in the next two years. And when I become independent, uh, I do want to open up a private practice in Florida. So maybe I'll be seeing you down there. Right. Absolutely. Uh, there's just, there's so many things we're working. We brought all of our, our medical billing in house. Um, we're completely switching our electronic health record system. Everything is just leveling up right now and just becoming more sophisticated. Yeah. Um, you know, again, we mentioned when right. I, I said we take, Medicaid only. We, I hate saying no to people. When someone calls, I hate telling them, hey, we don't accept your insurance. And so working on different funding sources, getting contracted in, uh, with all the, the funding sources, whether it's Medicare or commercial insurance lines, things like that. So we're just going to continue to grow and we're going to make sure that we grow the right way with our core values in place. I think that people are the most important thing when it comes to growing our agency. And my, I, I tell my team all the time, that we hire, fire, and reward our staff based off of them exhibiting our core values. And we will never hire somebody that does not exhibit our core values. And if we continue to do that, as we grow, everything is gonna be perfectly fine. Absolutely, I'm confident it will. I can't remember if I ever introduced you to my friend, Matt Lacasse. Yeah, Dr. Uh, yes, right? Dr. Lacasse. Yeah, Dr. Lacasse, yeah, Wonderful. he's terrific. Um, working at Children's Hospital, and now they're running a um, Children's Foundation funded clinic in Troy, Michigan for adolescents. I love that. Uh, yeah, so he, he and he's one of my favorite people. So uh, I wanted to make sure I, I pass that on to you. And then I also 
um, wanted to let you know that or remind you that the reason Judy, my wife and I moved to Stewart versus somewhere else in Florida is that coincidentally, when we moved, there was a Marcos opening up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so Marcos is our favorite pizza from Toledo. Yes. And you now have a family connection yes, uh, because your lovely bride uh, is a Gia Marco. That's right. Uh, That's so, right. So let her know we're doing our best to support the oh franchise and steward. So that's uh, amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see this. And I'm going to go home and yeah. tell her this right now. Yeah. So anyway, that that was something that that, that warmed our hearts when we moved here. So, uh, well, anything else you want our our viewers and our listeners to know, Matt? Is there ways they can help you or or get involved, or um, we can list things on the uh, on the podcast as well. So uh, anything no, you want to wrap up with? I wouldn't wrap up with anything. I'd just say share this. You know, it's it's an important message to get out there. And, you know, I I don't care. I don't care what you're struggling with, how many times you've fallen. Um, it's not over. We've got so much life left. It's never throw in the towel. If, if I could come back from all the things that I came back with, came back from, I should say, then then you can do it too. And so... Uh, I know it might feel like it's permanent, but everything's temporary, the good and the bad. And, and there are ways to get through it. And there are good ways to get through it. And the worst thing that you can do is, 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 is suffer in silence. Yeah. And give or up. Give up. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you. You, um, as always, you're, you're great to be around, fun to be around, inspiring to be around. Uh, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this, uh, Matt Bell. You too, Larry. Thank you so much. All right. Let's stay in touch. Absolutely. All right. Thank you.